human rights today have the kind of status that the divine right of kings had in the Middle Ages. They are so deeply ingrained in our political thinking that imagining a society without them seems almost impossible. We all know the famous line from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But we should beware of what seems self-evident. In many cases, what seems self-evident is less an indication of what is correct or indubitable, and more an indication of our biases, an effect of the time and place we live in. One of the most influential liberal political philosophers of the 20th century, John Rawls, once even stated that human rights are not the consequence of a particular philosophy, nor of one way among others of looking at the world. They are not tied to the cultural tradition of the West alone, even if it was within this tradition that they were formulated for the first time. They just follow from the definition of justice. That human rights simply follow from the definition of justice is, at the very least, a strange claim, because the notion of justice has been theorized at least since the ancient Greeks, whereas the doctrine of human rights was not fully formulated until the 17th century. Can we really untie the definition of justice from the vast majority of the term's history? Whenever we feel like some notion or idea is impossible to do without, there is a kind of therapy we can utilize. It's called history. By seeing how the idea of human rights emerged, we can then situate it as a product of a particular time and place, and thus hopefully remove the limits that it places on our political imagination. A crucial distinction is in order before we begin. The distinction between objective rights and subjective rights. Objective rights state what is right in general. For example, it is right to bury the dead, it is right to obey your parents, or it is right to serve your community. Notice that these do not attribute rights to an individual. They do not state whose right it is to bury the dead, merely that it is right. Subjective rights, on the other hand, are rights that are attributed to an individual, a subject, hence subjective. Examples would include the familiar rights from the Declaration of Independence. I have the right to liberty. I have the right to property. I have the right to a fair trial. These do not state what is right generally, but rather speak of rights as something that someone possesses. And it is this category, subjective rights, that constitutes the idea of human rights that we are all so familiar with, something that each human being owns, merely by virtue of being human. Today we pretty much identify rights as such with subjective rights. If someone speaks of rights, more often than not, we can assume they're speaking about the subjective variety. Yet, they're actually an incredibly recent invention. When, for example, ancient Greeks spoke of what is right, or lawful, or just, they had the objective conception in mind. To them, the idea of subjective right would probably be incomprehensible. In fact, sentences in the form of I have the right to something are not even possible to construct in ancient Greek. Ancient Greek philosophers commonly saw what is right, what is lawful, as being determined by the moral order of the world itself. What is right was not to be found in individuals, but in the harmonious order of things, in the relationships between the different parts of the world and one's community. Roman law famously defined justice as giving each person what is due to him. Reading this through the spectacles of our times, we might assume that what giving each person what is due to him means is something like respecting each person's individual property rights. But as I already mentioned, the notion of a subjective right had not even been formulated at the time. What was due to a person was determined not by the individual rights they possessed, but by their position in the larger community and their relationship to the other members of the community. The point of such distributive justice was to aim at social harmony, something that can only be understood in light of the community as a whole, rather than in terms of isolated individual rights. So what changed this brand of justice, so different from the one common in our times? What made it possible to think of rights as subjective? Like many things in the history of quote-unquote the West, one thing in particular is crucial. Christianity. First of all, Christianity conceived of each individual as having a soul, 
something which places each person in direct relationship to God, and thus gives each person a kind of absolute value. Because the soul exists independently both from one's personal qualities and the community one belongs to, it becomes possible to view individuals not as the specific members of their community, but instead as abstract human beings, each being equal in sharing a common essence. Because a soul is both universal and eternal, human beings could now be viewed in abstraction from both time and space, independently from the position they occupy in their community, or the world more generally. Secondly, certain Christians, for example William of Ockham, eventually argued that if the moral law is inherent in the order of things, it leaves no freedom for God, as God must follow the order of things as well. Because of this, gradually the moral law came to be seen not as something inherent in the order of things, but something stemming from the will of God. The importance of order is replaced by the importance of will. Finally, because we are created by God in the image of God, it takes a small step to identify the will of God with the will of each individual. Thus, the result is a morality built on universal abstract rights, which emanate from the will of each individual, by virtue of a shared human essence. We arrive at the full-fledged Enlightenment conception of human rights. Some might be surprised by the significant role played by Christianity in the development of human rights, but this was made very clear in the writings of the theorists developing human rights themselves. John Locke, for example, one of the main philosophical influences on the Declaration of Independence, started his theory of rights from the claim that God owns us as property, and therefore endows us with inalienable rights. And this is stated in the Declaration of Independence itself. Humans are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. The religious parallels don't end there. Human rights and belief in God are also similar in that both are supposed to be something self-evident, rather than something you can discover empirically. And just as nowadays people claim that without the doctrine of human rights, society would plunge into chaos, so people used to argue that society would plunge into chaos without the belief in God. So far, I've mostly been talking about ideas, namely Christian ideas. But ideas don't just float around in the heavens. In order to be effective, they need to be established materially in political and social life. The influence of Christianity is clear, but why is it that the ideology of human rights became so widely and rapidly accepted specifically in the 17th century and onwards, when Christianity had existed much longer than that? Well, if the ideas behind human rights are inseparable from Christian thought, then their political influence is inseparable from the rise of capitalism. In order for capitalism to kick off, the emerging capitalists had to buy a plan that was previously owned communally for the subsistence of the people living on it and turn it into land owned individually for profit. This was known as the enclosure movement during which many peasants who previously worked on commonly owned land, producing for their own consumption, were forcibly and often violently removed from said land, and, now propertyless, were forced to work for a wage. Thus, people who previously saw themselves as part of a larger community, working together to accomplish shared goals, now became isolated and atomized individuals, and the production process no longer responsible to their community, but to their boss, the individual capitalist. Collective solidarity was gradually replaced with individual competition. Workers ceased being fellow members in a shared community and became individuals competing for a wage. They became, in other words, individuals who got together in production in the pursuit of their own private individual interests, workers pursuing a wage and capitalists pursuing more capital. The ideology of human rights went hand in hand with the situation. It conceived of freedom primarily as negative freedom, freedom from, for example, freedom from interference, replacing the positive collective freedom people experienced in pursuit of shared goals before. Competition led people to view each other as something that they must be protected from, as something that constantly threatens to infringe on their quote-unquote rights. And this is also why social contract theory became so popular, positing that society was created through the establishment of a contract. 
if people are seen as individualized and atomized by default and get together only in pursuit of their own self-interest, then the only conceivable way to form a society is to sign a contract. This led to the strict separation between what Hegel called civil society on the one hand and the political state on the other. Civil society is the society of the market, of private individuals pursuing their private interests independently of anyone else. The political state, in contrast, is the sphere in which people get together to make common decisions, fixing the excesses of the civil sphere. Liberal society was shaped by this fundamental split, private individuals on one side and the state with its offices, courts, army, and police force on the other. Hence, Marx writes, Above all, we note the fact that the so-called rights of man are nothing but the rights of a member of civil society, i.e. the rights of egoistic man, of man separated from other men and from the community. The separation between civil society and the political state splits the individual into two. The private, egoistic individual of civil society on the one hand, and the political man, the citizen of the political state on the other. This also creates a tension in the ideology of human rights. Because they're supposed to exist independently of any particular political system, but can only be granted to a person if the state recognizes them as a citizen. The abstract universal human being is in constant tension with the particular citizen of a specific political community. The way in which human rights view individuals as universal and abstract was also befitting the capitalist production process, because when a capitalist hires workers, he views them as abstract individuals defined only by their labor power. And because the ideology of human rights posits that rights are formally equal for everyone, it helps obscure the vast and real power imbalances that exist between real people. For example, the state proclaims that the courts are fair, because everyone has an equal right to a fair trial. But this equal right obscures the fact that how fair your trial is depends on the lawyer you can afford. The doctrine of equal human rights does not actually make people equal, it just allows them to be viewed in abstraction from everything that actually makes them the person that they are. This is yet another tension found in human rights. On the one hand, their supposed purpose is to protect the autonomy of the individual, yet by its very nature, it must view human beings in abstraction from everything that actually makes them an individual. But even given all of this, it could still be the case that human rights have a net positive value, right? We should be careful not to commit a genetic fallacy here, judging that something is bad solely based on where it came from or how it emerged. It could be that rights are valuable even if they were originally declared to legitimate the interests of the emerging capitalist class. However, I think that the problem with human rights, at least as we understand and implement them, is inherent to them. To explain why, we must ask what their fundamental problem is. Let's begin from a starting point that is often overlooked or ignored in theory, the enforcement of rights. Liberal political theorists, when speaking of rights or laws, often avoid speaking of their enforcement like the devil. This is because the issue of enforcement brings to light the power dynamics at play. Who has the power to enforce? But in order for human rights to be effective, they have to be enforced, violently if necessary. So who enforces them? Well, those who have the power to enforce them, those who control the courts, the military, and the police force, namely the state, a state with the monopoly on violence. And in order to enforce such rights, they must be more powerful than you and have the permission to commit acts that you yourself cannot. And who does the state serve? Well, even if liberal ideology says that it serves society as a whole, it must by its very nature serve those who fund it. Otherwise, it would not receive the capital that allows it to exist in the first place. And who primarily funds it? The wealthy, in other words, the ruling class. It is their interests that it must represent. It's not a coincidence that some of the most influential human rights declarations were signed in palaces. A fundamental tension immediately begins to emerge here. In order for human rights to exist politically, there must be someone vastly more powerful than you giving you those rights in the first place. 
Human rights, which are supposed to make everyone equal, paradoxically depend on a fundamental power imbalance between groups with competing interests. And if someone more powerful than you is giving you your rights, then they can also take them away. But if this is the case, why would the state grant us rights at all? Here, Nietzsche's conception of rights in the genealogy of morals is very helpful. He writes, My rights are the part of my power which others have not merely conceded me, but which they wish me to preserve. How do these others arrive at that? First, through their prudence and fear and caution, whether in that they expect something similar from us in return, or in that they consider that a struggle with us would be perilous or to no purpose. So, say the working class is financially and politically impoverished. Tired of the situation, they organize together in a militant labor movement and threaten to overthrow the state. The state then recognizes the working class as powerful, powerful enough to pose a threat. And because they recognize this power, they decide to implement certain labor rights. These rights are not implemented because the state is benevolent or because it's enacting some eternal moral law. Rather, they are implementing these rights as a compromise between two competing powerful groups in the hope that this will appease the other party. That is how rights originate, recognized and guaranteed degrees of power. This way of looking at rights is more embedded in social and material reality. It helps us see how they emerge not as impartial eternal laws, but as the historical outcomes of struggle. Nietzsche continues. If power relationships undergo any material alteration, rights disappear and new ones are created, as is demonstrated in the continual disappearance and reformation of rights between nations. If our power is materially diminished, the feeling of those who have hitherto guaranteed our rights changes. They consider whether they can restore us to the full possession we formerly enjoyed. If they feel unable to do so, they henceforth deny our rights. So, to continue my example, if the working class ends up growing weaker, the state that previously granted it additional rights no longer sees them as necessary and take them away. Kind of like what happened in the emergence of neoliberalism in the 80s with Reagan and Thatcher. The elimination of previously won labor rights corresponded to a rapid weakening of the labor movement. In other words, the very existence of human rights presupposes the existence of a power struggle, of competing groups, with the more powerful one granting rights to the weaker one. As the journal Gegenstandpunkt writes, man has the right to be the servant of a master that attends to him. That is the miserable substance of the great enlightenment notion of the natural human right. It's no wonder that the first two countries to declare human rights, the United States and France, were also some of the last countries to abolish slavery. This power dynamic that we see between classes also exists between countries. Take the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, something with no historical precedent, which states that one nation can invade another for the purpose of stopping human rights violations. Who enforces the right of humanitarian intervention? Well, again, those who have the power to do so, the militarily and economically powerful. This creates a situation in which the powerful can use humanitarian intervention as a pretext to invade, destabilize, and exploit other countries, like what the US did with Yugoslavia, Libya, Syria, etc., while themselves not being accountable to anyone for their own human rights violations. Let me be clear here. I'm not saying that all these problems will be fixed if we simply stop adhering to the doctrine of human rights. Human rights are an outcome, a symptom of a specific social and political configuration. And you don't fight the symptom, you fight the disease. If we recognize the problem with human rights, it is the social and political configuration that produces them that we have to change. So long as we live under capitalism and the liberal political paradigm, rights are absolutely necessary. But if we limit our struggles to begging for the state to grant us rights, we will never address the more fundamental problem that human rights are a response to, the fundamental social and political imbalances that constitutes our society, the split between civil society and the political state, which is inseparable from the split between economic classes.
We can begin to see at this point that human rights and the divine right of kings are actually very similar in significant respects. Both are utilized by a minority of the population, the ruling class, to justify its rule by appealing to something independent of society, some metaphysical or moral law. Compare, sure, there are vast power imbalances between us, but we're all subjects of God, and we, the kings, are merely carrying out his will. And, sure, there are vast power imbalances between us, but we're all bearers of rights, and we, the state, are merely enforcing those rights. In other words, the ideology of human rights, like the ideology of the divine right of kings, tries to naturalize a historically contingent political situation, portraying it as something necessary. It involves an essential contradiction. It declares human rights to be something that exists independently of states, even though such human rights inherently presuppose the existence of a state. So, what would need to be done in order to establish a society that no longer produces or depends on the ideology of human rights? It would have to be a society in which the significance of community has been restored. A society where collective decision-making is not confined to the state, but characterizes society as a whole, starting from the local level. A society where production is not the affair of private individuals pursuing their self-interest, but a socially planned process. It is only when people reclaim power over their own lives and their own activities that they no longer need a state to grant them rights, because their powers would no longer be alienated by a state in the first place. When decision-making is no longer the task of a select minority of state functionaries and becomes the task of everyone concerned, only then can freedom be realized. Not the abstract sham freedom of the atomized individual, but the real freedom that can only be realized through association with others. Such a society would have done away with the distinction between civil society and the political state, between the individual human and the abstract citizen. As usual, no one puts it as beautifully as Marx. Only when the real, individual man reabsorbs in himself the abstract citizen, and as an individual human being has become a species being in everyday life, in his particular work and his particular situation, only when man has recognized and organized his own powers as social powers and, consequently, no longer separates social power from himself in the shape of political power, only then will human emancipation have been accomplished. Such a society may be as hard for us to imagine as it would have been for a serf to imagine ours, but... It is only when we reject the political dogmas of our times that we can begin to envision emancipation. And now, let me thank my private individuals of civil society, collected here, only in pursuit of their own self-interest. Apply a quine that doesn't work on 37th call, a pronounceable name, and of course, computer scare. Andres Oliva, Chinese with socialist characteristics. Christopher, Clark Fletcher, Dancing Vulture. Dasan, Evie Rosk, Edison Hua, Elliot Rosenstock, Ethan Hastings, Ewix, Finlay, Frege Beach, Gary Coulter, G G G G G K K K K, Gub Gub Col Col, Huang Vu, Je sais quoi tu n'aimes pas penser la français, Shuk Slag, Jordan Hoxie, Justin Armijo, Jurgen Lips, Capsi, Carly Mainlander, Kelly Rankin, Butts. M. Lim, Malkavian Madness, Markle Pax, Mad Gold, Meme Manifest, Mikhail Nenkov, Mr. Snickers, Nicholas Pash, Paul Cat, Rachel Ann, Robert Seals, Sarah Sitkin, Sebastian Roll, Syntax 88, Sweet Injections, Synclone Bresgall, Tendies 123, Theodore Sandal Rolfson, Trevor Stevenson, Ukendoka, Victor Van of Aaron, Wi-Fi, Voxaculi, Tired of the Times, and Zim, as well as all of these private, egoistic individuals. I'd also like to thank the fellow YouTubers who read out quotes for this video. They are great, and you can find their info below. This has probably been my hottest take yet, because we're going full radical here on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed it, and remember, abolish everything. Thank you.